Pebble Black. Back on it again. Yes, sir. Good Juma. You know, it's a Juma morning recording session. It's a lot to talk about in this world, bro. A lot to talk about. There's been a lot of new political developments. A lot of new neo-colonial developments. Yeah. A lot of new assimilationist developments. A lot of new talented 10th developments. But hey, <laughs> we got an episode in store for y'all, man. Before we dive into it, shout out to everyone that's been supporting as always. If you can, and if you haven't yet, please subscribe to our Patreon, patreon.com backslash hella black pod. Uh, like, subscribe on uh, all of our streaming platforms. You know, leave us a comment on as an Apple Podcast, Spotify, YouTube. As always, uh, this podcast wouldn't exist without the support of the people. Um, yeah, it, like you said, it's, I be laughing, but it's not funny. You know, I do take what's happening very, very serious, but it's hard not to laugh. Uh, sometimes, especially, you know, it seems that the Democratic Party has found new life following uh, what they call him, Sleepy Joe, uh, s- stepping out of the presidential and race. Kamala finally unburdened Joe Biden. Yeah. And like you know, what was before. <laughs> it was wild because, you know, before, uh, I guess before, if we look at like the last few months, right, it was in some polls like reported that it was like a 50 50 race. Uh, between Biden and Trump and then following uh, the debacle of the debate in June, you saw uh, Biden beginning to uh, lose in certain polls. And it was so bad that, you know, it seems like privately and publicly you had Democrats saying that it was time for him to step down. Uh, And so as a result, it looks like, you know, Kamala will be his replacement and again, with this, they have seen the Democrats have seen to, you know, make a resurgence and gather new life. And like you talked about, this is we're seeing like a, a shift as it pertains to like neo-colonialism and uh, integration and assimilation. And, you know, we definitely thought that it will be necessary for us to do a podcast and hopefully provide some clarity in this very confusing time and um I was looking back because I was talking to my little cousin, and, you know, he's trying to develop his political consciousness. And he was saying that he went back and listened to an episode that we did on Kamala Harris as a result of what's happening recently. So uh, if you go back to episode 35, uh, you'll be able to hear some of our takes, uh, our analysis on Kamala Harris Um from what years this is like 2018 Uh, maybe 2019 (laughs) 2019 hey you gotta respect it well you you said go back to episode 35 35, not 135 go back to 35 yeah and see see what we was talking about i mean anybody with eyes you know a little bit of common sense i think would have been able to see what see what's going on but yeah. I don't know if I would have predicted this. I mean, I guess we did probably. We, we, did, we, we did predict this. Yeah. I was looking back on some of my old tweets. I'm like, whoa. You know what I'm saying? It's mm-hmm. like to read it. But like, oh, yeah, yeah. Because even I was out at one tweet. I said, yeah, Kamala Harris, she ain't going to be running for. This is when she was running for the presidential nominee. Mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, she ain't even going to get no presidential nominee at all. But she's about to be the vice president. Mm-hmm. And then it's like, ooh, shoot. Then she become vice president. Then, you know, Joe Biden's cognitive decline was very rapid. And people always is like, oh, once she's vice president, there's a good chance of her becoming president. You know what I'm saying? Like, okay, Joe might not make it through, and then now he ain't make it through. It's a much easier you know sale and, and transition. Like, you know, the transition, you know, because realistically, if you go back to that nominee process, she got wiped out very quickly. You feel me? Like, she was dropped out. She didn't poll very well. You know what I'm saying? She was out the race very quickly. But there were certain interests that had uh, – you know, Kamala Harris wanting her to become, uh, you know, a presidential nominee at one point to where you can make a case that this was very much so an undemocratic way of getting Kamala Harris to the top uh, of the presidential nominee for the Democratic Party. You know, it's the Democratic Party, the super Negro identity machine, you know, mm-hmm. propelled her to the top, <laughs> you know, and trying to use that similar type of 
uh, electability that they used for quote unquote Barack Obama with that o- Obama plan using that. Uh, quote unquote tap dance and minstrel show of blackness, <laughs> yeah. you know, to get black people, quote unquote people of color, galvanized into this electoral genocidal system of governance. Yeah, I mean, with every cycle, right, you're going to have people that become disillusioned. And so it's going to be in your best interest uh, as any political party to try to galvanize like new interest, right? And so if you're the Democrats and people have become disgusted with, uh, Joe Biden, whether you're talking about like the neoconservatives who like actually believe in American nationalism or the more quote unquote like radical liberals who are uh, really disgusted with the way that uh, his administration has backed Israel and are becoming uh, again disillusioned with him. And so what is the best way to galvanize new participation? Like you need a fresh face. And we was talking about it yesterday like this is an opportunity for the Democratic Party to galvanize like a whole new black demographic, a whole like a whole new black demographic, or to just uh, you know those people who are around the fence, like kind of like not feeling it anymore, to get them re-energized. Like, okay, now we got you know this black woman from the Bay Area, sorority, you know, it's, it's the identity like it's like it's 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 identifying with a lot of people you can identify with the ghetto you can identify with uh the petty bourgeoisie and you can identify with the elitist like we was talking about it yesterday um i was watching the rally and again it's hard not to laugh i know this is very serious and like what happens here has international implications but when you see like it's hard. You like you think you're watching this. I thought I was watching a spoof. Like she had like this body language and this dialectic, like very much like, like you can't like I was saying you can't call it blackface because she is black. But this is like some serious pandering. You feel me? Like this whole like, like if like somebody likes like some shenane type shit. You feel me? Like it's like it's just it was it was wild to watch. I'm laughing and then like in the middle of her rally, like the recap or like the YouTube video comes on the ad for her campaign, and now she's like this very like stoic stale face like help me defeat donald trump it's like damn what happened to the, like the shit you was just doing in atlanta the, sister the, the girl sister you feel girl. like all that all that type of stuff and then i seen uh that she brought meg to style you know i'm like oh man like this is just it's like really disrespectful. they show us every day how much they think of the people and like i think like men, uh like that element of like mental slavery uh, that comes up a lot when you talk about the the colonial subjects, like the, the warping and controlling of the mind that, you know, unemployment is sky high, uh, houselessness and poverty is sky high. You know, like when she was the California, uh, what is it, uh, district attorney, attorney, attorney general, like the California prisons were so flooded that they were, that they were saying it was unconstitutional, the same constitution that, you know, uh, legalize the slavery via uh, punishment of a crime, right? Like these, these are the material facts. Like this is the economic and social political reality. But the fact that, you know, she can identify with quote unquote black culture, like completely uh, like dismisses all of that. And it's just a, a very, very uh, wicked game. And she's saying stuff like, you know, I told I told Trump to come say it in my face. <laughs> we like, what? Like, what is this like reality TV bad girls club shit that's happening right in front of our faces on a that's supposed to be determined in like our actual everyday material lives? Like, this is what they do to make you participate in something that's completely against your like individual and communal interest, really. Yeah, at the end of the day, like the end of the day and the start of the day, American politics is just political theater. You know, they've morphed it into essentially a reality television using Hollywood as this grand control of theatrics that tries to get people uh, involved in the day-to-day quote-unquote operations of this country, even though in reality people talk about vote this, vote for that, but the Electoral College is choosing the president every single presidential election, Mm -hmm. the popular vote. What is a popular vote when there's an Electoral College? So it's getting people to buy into this bourgeoisie idea of democracy of quote-unquote making change 
and in reality, you was just wasting your time rather than actually getting involved politically in your community. But they have like indoctrinated us so far into thinking that changes happen through the presidency. You know what I'm saying? Thinking that the president is the quote unquote ruler of all America. But if anything, this Joe Biden presidency should show you exactly who's really in control. You feel me? Because if we see Joe Biden as this old man who's obviously in cognitive decline, obviously <laughs> is having a whole ton of issues, is in bed with COVID-19 at his little Delaware house, who is actually making the uh, decisions day to day in this country? Like, be realistic. Do you feel me? Like, do you really think that old man who can barely walk, who barely even remembers uh, his wife, you feel me? Like, about to go kiss on a whole nother girl because you think it's your wife? Like, do you really think he's making the decisions for this country? Or is it the corporate ruling class? Is it the Central Intelligence Agency? Is it the, you know, the deep state? You know? So we got to ask ourselves, why are they running a person like Kamala Harris? And, like, critically try to uh, ask ourselves why. They want to get colonized people bought into this electoral process. Mm -hmm. You feel me? Because realistically, she don't have no chance. <laughs> it's a different ball game. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. it's a different ball game in terms of where we are politically. But when's the last time there's been a president of this country that don't got no family? It's been maybe four presidents who've had no family. You feel she me? She ain't, got no, she, she ain't got no she kids. Ain't. Yeah. You feel <laughs> me? So every, you know, every yeah. president. There's still values that this nation has. You know has. what I'm saying? It's yeah. like the family values. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Then you were, <laughs> you're supposed to be the first woman who's a president and you ain't got no kids. Like, it goes against, like, the general <laughs> rules of political science. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Then it's like, okay, you fast-tracked within 100 days. Why was you fast-tracked? So, for me, you know, she's trying to get people bought back into that process, the the TikTok generation. You know what I'm you saying? You know what she's going to do? She's going to endorse him after it's all said and done. She's going to endorse him. That's what they always do. You know, so I think it's the Democratic Party potentially waving that white flag and also getting rid of all this, uh, you know, uh, identity politics as well that has been uh, characterized uh, the past, you know, decade over that uh, of, of the Democratic Party, right? Using identity to get at people, um, to get people involved into the quote unquote Democratic machine. But realistically, that campaign is failing. You feel me? Like, it didn't work with Hillary Clinton. It's not going to work with Kamala. Uh, so the Democratic Party has to make a shift, right? Because it's kind of tried to get at these, quote unquote, whatever these liberal values are of, oh, yeah, you know, women's rights, quote unquote, you know, mm -hmm. the, the the facade of women's rights, right? Uh, the facade of being better towards black people and people of color, uh LGBTQ rights, right, going into super identity mode that the Democratic Party has, they've also realized that they're losing voters and losing a base of voters through that. So what are they going to do? They're going to put the, you know, as Trump calls it, a DEI hire. <laughs> they're going to put the identity candidate up in front of everybody, have her lose, and then in 2028 have a complete rebrand and, you know, you get your white man running for president again and you ain't going to have no a black woman up there. You're going to have that Gavin Newsom. You're going to have that Shapiro up there. You know what I'm saying? That good, quote unquote, uh, uh, American white man mm -hmm. is back in that, you know, they get a new, quote unquote, Bill Clinton of the Democratic Party rather than this, uh, uh, you know, uh, identity uh, stuff that they've been trying to play in and play, play with voters in that regard. So yeah, we will see. Before I ask you this question, I, I really want to ground folks and the fact that I think we often forget just like where we are. Like this is a settler colonial nation that is built on the tenets of white European nationalism. Do not forget that there are 231 million of them and 45 million new Africans here. Like this, don't let them convince you that this is some, like this is a white nationalist country that was built on genocide and the transatlantic slave trade and the morals and values uh, that were put forth via the Constitution or would still govern this place. So do not fall into, they could put whatever, like you said, all this DEI stuff in front of you at the end of the day. This is 
a Euro-American settler colonial genocidal project. Don't forget where you are. The sooner you accept where you are, remember where you are, like this is where we talk about that matrix, like you actually forget like what this whole thing is. You've been convinced that you are moving upward. And then what does it mean to be integrating into something that is built on settler colonial genocide? People want to say free Palestine, but participate in the settler colonial project of the United States of America. And endorse Kamala Harris. <laughs> like, what, are we, what are we doing? <laughs> That's what's wild. Is like people went free Palestine, free Palestine to your next post being like, yeah, we got to get Kamala elected. Like she ain't the vice genocider in chief. Like she ain't the one giving getting millions from APAC. Like she ain't the one talking about unconditional support for Israel. Like th- she ain't married to a Zionist. Y'all should, uh, well, if you go to YouTube, you should search like uh, Jewish, American Jewish organization endorses Kamala Harris. And um, these are Zionists, like just flat out. These are Zionists um, parading around as if they practice the religion of Judaism. These are Europeans in <laughs> uh, cloaks of Judaism pushing uh, again, uh, settler colonial genocide, right? And in this video, one of the endorsement videos, it starts off with Kamala and her husband lighting a menorah. It's just straight pander to the Zionists, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and in it, she says, and I quote, um, where is this quote at? Hold on. She says, I have had an unwavering commitment to the existence of the state of Israel to its security, and to the people of Israel. So, in other words, a vote for Kamala is a vote for genocide. These are her words, not mine. Her un, she says she has had, not I, I have had. I have been a staunch supporter of Zionism. I stand with Israeli security. Now, if you read between the lines, that's what the IDF, that's uh, Mossad, that's whatever intelligence, uh, paramilitary force, you want to think of, or that's just the mm-hmm. day-to-day Zionist that's outside, you know, taking people's homes. That's she says she stands for that. These and then look words. at look at what's happening literally right now. Netanyahu literally came to America, came to Congress, spoke with Trump, spoke with Biden, spoke with Harris, and what happened as soon as that 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 uh, Shaitan came back to the Zionist occupation? What happened? Assassinating leaders of the resistance in Iran, assassinating leaders of the resistance in Lebanon striking Iraq. This is all under the rule. This is all under the approval of a Kamala Harris. And y'all have have like really the audacity to say you against genocide and then want to be pro Kamala Harris. Like that is just cognitive dissonance by its definition. <laughs> by its complete definition. And then you want to essentially almost be drunk off Kamala. Which means you completely remove any type of reason, any type of thought, any type of criticism. And then you say when people criticize her, you're like, oh, so you're going to vote for Donald Trump? You pro-Trump then? But you can't just name like exactly what she is. Let's say hypothetically, even if you are voting for her, why wouldn't you actually tell the truth about who she is? I mean, because people don't know who she is outside of her being black and being in a sorority and being from the Bay Area. Yeah. Like, that's like, those are, <laughs> like, when you talk about identity politics, you feel me, like, identifying with the, um, like, outward appearance of something and meaning that, that that something has, is aligned with you morally, uh, aligned with you ethically, Align with your practices has the same political stance as you because like that's like the oldest trick in the book. Feel me? Like that's just like that's like nineteen sixties, you feel me? Integration, national liberation era type things where it's just like let's just put an African in power. Because the people haven't realized just yet that uh we as exploiters, we as capitalists who are looking to have global domination, aka imperialism. We can put these people in power, but still run, still run everything, and that's what is we would call neo-colonialism. And so, I think uh, being able to define, state for the listeners, like what is neo-colonialism and how has you know Kamala Harris been a pillar of it, uh, like in the twenty-first century. Yeah, I think it's important that we understand, like you were saying, understanding exactly where we where we are 
right? Understanding <laughs> we're in a settler colony of the United States of America, a colony, a settler colony that has enacted genocide against indigenous people, genocide against African people, enslaved African people, a settler colony that has been found guilty of genocide. <laughs> Uh, when we think about imperialism, America is the top dog of imperialism. This is the uh, beyond this nation state. <laughs> it's a global empire, right? So when we understand that and we understand our position here as black people uh, living in this country, we have to understand that, A, we as colonized, right? Uh, we as a colonized nation living under the complete uh, and total domination by the United States of America's government, right? Uh, the question we must ask ourselves, are we free or have we ever been free? <laughs> right. So understanding our neo-colonial position means uh, that we understand that this project of integration uh, has been meant to integrate the colonized people, the colonized new African nation uh, into the system of government of the United States of America in order to do the job of the United States of America. So it gives this quote unquote, outward look of new African people, of black people being quote unquote free because we have a Barack Obama, because we have a Jay-Z, because we have a Kamala Harris, because we have a Condoleezza Rice, because we have a Meg Thee Stallion, because we have a, um, a Beyonce, right? Giving the outward trappings, the outward illusion of black people being free. But the reality is we're in a position uh, of being colonized uh, in the in the settler nation that they call the United States of America, so we got to look at this uh, as a strategy similar to what you know happened on the African continent, uh, where they put new leaders up, put different types of uh, people in positions of power. But the reality is, the United States of America or the former colony uh, is still under complete uh, control politically, socially, uh, economically, and militarily. So that's what we are right now. That's what we we have right now is this neo-colonial position in the United States of America, where the masses of African people, the masses of new African people, are enslaved, are colonized, are oppressed, and you have this uh, sellout uh, comprador class that is working for the for the ruling class, um, thinking that they free, or very well knowing that they ain't free, but they choose the side of the oppressor uh, when the masses of their people. Are oppressed, so that's what Kamala Harris is. She's a, a neo-colonialist by definition, right? And that has been essentially her whole career has been of neo-colonialism. Her whole career has been literally going to the other side. You feel me? Whether it was her being a district attorney in Alameda County, her being a district attorney uh, in San Francisco, right? Her then rising up <laughs> to be the top cop of California as an attorney general to wearing her police jacket down at the border, right? Then to becoming the senator, <laughs> then to becoming a vice genocider in chief, to now running to be the genocider in chief of the United States of America. She is literally the, what they say, the quintessential example mm -hmm. <laughs> of neocolonialism. And she follows a path of neocolonizers. She follows that same type of Barack Obama. You know what I'm saying? Right. She comes from that very Obama. You got to kind of credit him, I'd say. That mother, like he is he a devil, but he's smart. You know what I'm saying? Like he was a product. You can make you say you make the case that he's a product of the CIA. Yeah, sure. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. You could say the same thing about Kamala Harris. She's a product of the CIA. Right. If she's a product of uh, what I would say, uh, you know, Arranged relationships. How do you go? Well, from so they've been like kind of like uh, like groomed. Her. You know, yeah, she's, yeah. she's been groomed for this position. Obama's yeah. been groomed for this position. They know better. They know exactly what they're doing. Mm -hmm. You feel me? Like you know, she goes from uh, Willie Brown to 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 uh, Doug Emhoff, right? Those are like the arranged relationships of the CIA of putting people in positions of power of grooming people with these ruling class relationships to be able to quote unquote govern this country, right? So she's been a, a, a pillar of neocolonialism, a pillar of trying to integrate black people in this quote unquote system and also get new Africans uh, to buy into this system from a, a conscious level where they're like, all right, yeah, I'm, I'm a part of America. Yeah, I'm at the table. See, we got a we got a black woman president who's, you know, uh, a.k.a. who went to Howard. She's one of us. You know, she she went through a lot when she was bust on buses in Berkeley and you know what I'm saying? And now look at her now. She is she is black girl magic. Right? So it's getting black people to buy into this genocidal 
uh, culture that is not ours, but is really a product of neocolonialism. And that is a very uh, dangerous weapon because we essentially consent to it. We buy into it. We say this is a part of us, but in reality, uh, this has nothing to do with us. This has nothing to do with our history. This has nothing to do with our, our, our values, our morality um, as as a people. This is a, a foreign, uploaded, mm-hmm. <laughs> genocidal consciousness that uh, essentially is uh, puts us in a suicidal position as a masses of people. Yeah, and that, that thing about neocolonialism, like I think as you're talking about it, it might be hard for people to conceptualize it like in their day-to-day life because it has that like subtlety, you know, that like Nkrumah talks about a lot in terms of uh, like you have all the trappings of uh, independence, right? You get like, for us here as a uh, new Africans, uh, as, a, as a nation within a nation, right? Like we would consider ourselves free because what we're not quote unquote on the plant- plantation anymore. Right, we would we would say that progress is being made because at one point we couldn't vote, but now we can vote. At one point we couldn't have a podcast. Now we you know, it's like, like these, or you got like black people, like you said, like Jay Z, like you got yeah. like people who are worth yeah. billionaires. You know what I'm saying? You Urbanization. Can get, everyone can get a car for the most part. Everyone you can feel get a me? Phone like on everyone, you know what I'm saying? Versus like in Nigeria or some shit in villages where they don't have tech, where they don't have like um, electricity 24 hours a day. Right, so it's like these very. Uh, like these subtle things where like you see this progression uh, and then if, like you said with this downloaded consciousness like if you just don't have the height of it yet you just figure that the sun just hasn't shined on you yet when in reality like it it never will and even if it does like what does it mean for the sun to shine on you in capitalism that now you got your chance to exploit right uh, and so you know there's this thing where uh, Kamala Harris as an agent of neocolonialism she does in a sense represent, represent progress as it pertains to like the integration of the American ideal right you know, she's the first black woman vice president. Uh, she could potentially be the first uh, black woman president. But again, if once we get past um, these like facades of progression, we can start to look at what she did materially. Right. Uh, and if we look at like from a basic, you know, like economic sector as it pertains to like the relationship between economics and uh, people's ability to work and have their needs met. Like, you know, she's going to try to ride the coattail of the Biden administration and like the stuff that he was putting forth. And his campaign run, like, oh, we've created uh, 272,000 jobs in May. But it's like, okay, let's do a deeper dive into, like, something. Just saying that. Like, what kind of jobs was it? The high percentage of it was leisure and hospitality. So motherfuckers working in hotels and restaurants. Uh, and across the nation where you have a, what, like, the federal minimum wage is $7.25. Like, what are we talking about here? Uh, transportation and theme parks. <laughs> Come on, bro. Like, they're not, they're not giving us anything that can actually uh, lead to, like, sustainability. You know, like when you have the same, they can say they have 272,000 jobs, but you still got that st- statistic where it's like over 70% of folks living in America can't afford a $500 emergency. You feel me? Like, so like what, they give us these like very uh, like like boasted up or like fluffed up numbers, but in reality, the numbers don't mean anything, right? So if we look at economically, like she's not progressing the masses of the people. And as long as capitalism is the economic system that governs this nation, it, there's nothing any president can do for us but continue to find new ways to exploit, right? If we look at, we talked about where she's, for things that might be important to you. If jobs matter to you, this is her stance on jobs. If economics matter to you, that's her stance on economics. Uh, let's say, like again, the war in Gaza means something to you. She has already said she has and will continue to have unwavering support for the state of Israel, to the security of Israel and to the Israeli people and that they have the right to defend themselves by any means possible. So, Again, a vote for Kamala is a vote for genocide. So if you care about economics and you care about people, that's where she stands on it. But let's say you don't care about people or economics, but you care about the planet. She, <laughs> you know, like some weird people be having that. You know, I don't care. They don't care about people, but they care about the planet. <laughs> you know, she's already said that she will support big oil companies and is looking like one of her campaign things she ran on uh, when she was running, trying to be a presidential candidate. Was she was like, I'm against fracking. She's already said, I'm not going to stop that anymore. Like, I'm willing to let y'all pillage the earth for oil by any means possible if it means, you know, uh, BP and Exxon and Chevron and Shell will continue to support my campaigns and support my administration. So, you know, if she says she's going to go to war for water, you know, so it's like if if people don't mean nothing to you, if the planet don't mean nothing to water you, water don't mean nothing to you, you know, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead and she vote for it. She want to kill for water. <laughs> go go ahead, water. go ahead and vote for it. And. 
yeah, man, it's just uh, it's very it's very nasty work, and you know we I'm laughing and giggling, but again, this has like real implications for people. You know, like this has real implications for Palestinians when she says like I'm going, you know, I'm gonna support y'all, whether that's sending in you know agents and intelligence officers to uh, run plays to lead to assassinations or more displacement and genocide, or if that's just you know me buying up more Israeli bonds and having our, our individual uh, states uh, send money to Boeing and Rolls Royce and Lockheed Martin to give y'all uh, shells on top of shells and uh, bombs on top of bombs and tanks on top of tanks. I'm going to do whatever it, it takes. Uh, that's her she, stance. She's so much of a Zionist that she's been to the Zionist occupation more times than her Zionist like she did birth Jewish right. husbands. <laughs> Well, she's she, she, she been to the Zionist like, occupation yeah. more than her Zionist Jewish husband. That should tell you who Kamala Harris is. She more down than he is. That should tell you, right? Yeah. So, but this again is American politics. This is what it is. This is the illusion of choice. This is what they give you. Yeah. Two people who want the destruction of the world. And it just might have a little bit of a different methodology but of how they do it. What's the difference, though? Because that's what I'm trying to figure out. Because you were saying someone has said to you, like, oh, so you're just going to vote for Trump. And I'm like, man, if, again, based off what we just read, they both support Israel. They both support They both support genocide. They both uh, support uh, domestic exploitation of the workers. Um, they both support international uh, capitalism, uh, a.k.a. imperialism. Like, what's the difference? I mean, one just call at, you a nigger, one treat you like a nigger. Like, I mean, let's look at like, also like, if we look at an analysis, you know, of Trump versus the Biden administration, look what has happened. Look what has happened under the Biden administration versus the Trump administration. Mm -hmm. Again, we could look at the ruling class, of course, and the ruling class is uh, uh, dictating certain things that happen, but Ukraine happened. Under the Biden administration, mm -hmm. right, and this uh, continuation of a genocide happened under the Biden administration. Millions and billions given to the Zionist occupation into the Ukrainian regime. That didn't happen under Trump. You feel me? So Biden put more money for the police compared to Trump. Biden was like, hey, let's get some more money. Let's stop. All these cop cities was happening under who? Trump or Joe Biden? Biden. So look at this reality. We see a black woman being killed on camera in their own house. And you telling us to vote for a black woman who had her career as a cop. So, like, let's just be real about what this is. Poison is poison, evil is evil. Whether it's Trump, whether it's Kamala Harris. And we just have to tell the truth about that. Cause that's what it is. How is it better? How like you gonna tell me you gonna tell the kid in Gaza who just lost half their family that Kamala Harris is better for you than Donald Trump? You gonna tell motherfuckers here who's suffering. That Kamala Harris is better when the, when, know, the, when the stats say differently. Cal, California, you know, Gavin Newsom just putting out this new uh, order to remove all houseless people. You gonna tell the houseless people that oh, Kamala Harris is better for you in the Democratic Party? And the Democratic Party is better for you than Donald Trump when it's Gavin Newsom sweeping up L.A. because he's getting ready for his presidential election run and that's going to be his running thing is hey I fixed LA before the Olympics <laughs> mm -hmm. it's just sad because like they can tell you one thing it's like you know like you know like the uh, old black saying like don't piss on me and tell me it's raining like they can do that to you like she can get up in 2020 and say like I support the uh, defund the police movement while simultaneously pumping more funds into uh, domestic police forces and into the IDF while being a cop like what what like, are we talking about? Why y'all talking about build more schools and less cops, less jails, build more schools? She literally like mocked you all, and then you all are wanting to vote for her because it's a better option. And what's yeah? I mean, it's just again, this is the lack of consciousness. 
because realistically, if you understood California, <laughs> if you understood politics, you would realize that even you voting has this California is going to be blue no matter who. That's the fact of the matter, you know. Uh, but just thinking about how much black people is getting worked up by, by you know, Kamala's potential run is a byproduct, you know, if people really wanted something to believe in uh, versus, you know, an American engineered political participation, you know. And so for people looking to help shape the consciousness of these respective groups, you know, what should be their approach? I mean, you just said it a little bit earlier in terms of uh, like this is where consciousness comes into play. And so, like, when you're dealing with consciousness, of course, you have to kind of address it all by, like, a case-by-case basis. Because I think about, like, myself, like, as, as a young, uh, like, young Delancey, right? And I was, when I was doing the research for the pod yesterday, I was thinking about how, like, when Obama was elected, right? That was 08? What, what year was that? 08? In 12 as well? When we, yeah, first when time, we first, time first time, the first time. I think 08, yeah, yeah, yeah. The first time, right? And I remember just like I was on fifty fourth at my I was in the north at my granny house, right? And uh like I literally remember like texting my mom, like I can't believe he did it. I was like fifteen, like six maybe sixteen, seventeen years old, right? It's just like really believing like damn, like a black man could be president, like we could do anything. <laughs> it's like I'm laughing right now, but that's actually like we're talking about cognitive dissonance. You yeah, feel no, me? I like that's I was like, I almost got in a fist fight. <laughs> <laughs> In college over this Because I had Man, I was on a rugby team, bro Oh, shit Bro, oh, so my, it was like Like, that's funny, but that's hella sad it's like, But because it was all like hella Romney Because remember, it was yeah, Romney yeah, running yeah, yeah. And it was just It was just damn near being racist It was racist, point. I get it You yeah, feel yeah. me? So I'm like, nah, man You feel me? Like, y'all was really like Wanting Romney I'm like, yeah, the nigga won I'm Like <laughs> I'm ready to throw fans in my living room. Ain't that hella sad, though? That's hella sad. And when you talk about, like, that mental slavery, you know, like, who knew, like, I had no idea that this man was about to be, like, the bane of my existence and, like, cause so much turmoil for African people. And had already caused turmoil. If you think about, you know, what he did in Chicago, if you think about his family's connections to the CIA in South Africa, you feel me? Like, what? We were literally getting riled up for shaitan in human form. Like, like, if you think about what, like, if you talk about devilish behavior, uh, killing people, oppressing people, exploiting people. And so I think about, like, a young me, how much I could have benefited from someone, like, just, like, sitting me down and, like, hey, brother, like, I know, you know, like, you're caught up in his outward appearance. But, like, how much do you know about, have you ever heard of the term capitalism? You feel me? Let me tell you, have you ever heard of neocolonialism? Have you ever heard of imperialism? Like, I could have really benefited from that. So I think for us... You know, your question is, like, what do we do with the... Uh, I think it's both in, right? I think if in t- it's in terms of, like, people actually need something to believe in. Like, where me, you feel me? I was just, uh, like, completely blown away that uh, a black person could reach the highest level of authority uh, in this country. Uh, but again, so, I guess I think it was something we needed to believe in something. And what happens when you need to believe in something and you don't really know a lot? You know, like, you uh, miseducated. So, I think... With the youth who are, because that's what they always do, you know, they're going to put the babies in the shit, you know, so it's like getting to them youth and teaching them, like, what this thing is, like, helping them define their reality, right? Um, and then I think for the people who can continue to fall victim to this, like, cycle every few years is just finding, um, it's doing what the Democratic Party does and find like how they find new ways to get them invested, we have to co- constantly find new ways to get them to divest, right? And so I think that like me and you, we talk about a lot how like we just got so much work to do as like cadres because at the end of the day, like what more do we really have to offer at times besides like lip service? Because again, the jobs may be shitty, but they can really say we created 272,000 jobs in one month. Like what can, like some of these cadres don't even have like, contr- like we don't even have control over our actual cadres. You feel me? Like we can't even act- actually organize like decent programs internally at times before we can even take them externally. Um, but again, that doesn't mean we don't have, like that doesn't mean we should stop talking the truth, but we got to just figure out how to show them something material, right? To get them again, like uh, to divest and realize that there is another alternative. Because I was thinking like, you know, like, what do we say to our grand? Like, I don't know about, you know, you. Uh, I don't know about like, your side, but like, I know, like, I have people in my family who are like actually like worked up about Kamala. You know, like, 
older black women in my family and like, what do I say to them when they come from the Jim Crow South? At one point where we know like you could actually die for even registering to vote. Like you were under surveillance for attending like uh, voter registration parties in Alabama with Lowndes County Freedom Organization. You know what I'm saying? Like in these different rural South areas, like what SNCC was doing, you feel me in terms of like voter registration, like you could actually die. So what do I look like going to somebody who didn't, you feel me being like, oh, you shouldn't vote when that's like the history behind it. You know, like, well, like so it's just like, it's a, it's just like rural life that we're dealing with, you know, but again, I think uh, to answer the question, it's a combination of the two. You have people who need something to believe in. You have people who are falling victim to um, the like propaganda machine of integration and electoral uh, politics and pseudo democracy. And I think uh, the constant political education program is important. But we as cadres, we have to like start getting some real like infrastructure. And showing them like, hey, like this is what we created with our very limited resources. You feel me? Like what the Black Panther Party was doing with their programs. And this is what like, you know, it goes back to I think what comes up in all of our episodes, political education and decolonization programs. You feel me? Like what are the decolonization programs that we like? How do we elevate them to a point where, you know, Jalil talks about with phase two where you have like that kind of uh, community belief and uh, institutional uh, control. Uh, yeah, I hope this provides somewhat of clarity to the listeners in terms yeah. of how I would approach it. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, it's, uh, it's the reality versus, you know, uh, I think sometimes we can just get, uh, caught in these echo chambers versus dealing with the reality mm-hmm. of like, are you saying for like the, like, like the, like quote unquote revolutionaries or potential revolutionaries? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's yeah. like, we have to speak truth. To what is happening, right? But then also we have to have the truth of the understanding of like what is actually happening with black folks, black voters, quote unquote. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like the truth is, you know, I predict there's going to be more black people voting for Trump than that has happened. But also there's going to be more people coming out, new voters, quote unquote, coming out for Kamala Harris. Yeah. You know, uh, and like you were saying, like, you know, people coming from that background of, of the South and seeing voting as something which was at that time period. You know what I'm saying? Like people was voting not to become American. People was voting because they saw that as an ability to make change at that time period. And like sometimes like on a more like local and level. As a very local yeah. thing for your uh, as a part of a broader strategy for mm-hmm. freedom. Mm-hmm. But they were fighting for freedom. You know, so they're coming from that type of lens, mm-hmm. understandably, but. You know, I think it's just uh, exposing that this voting stuff is a lot different. And they made sure to make it different. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And just even in terms of, like, political power in this quote-unquote country. You know, it ain't mm-hmm. the same as how it was then. So I think it's uh, being able to name exactly what's happening. You know? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and and tell the truth around it. And then you could all, and then I think sometimes people are like, oh, you're voting for Kamala. I ain't going to talk to you. It's like, nah, that should be our attitude. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because it's like, people, some people go vote for Kamala. That's the only, they feel like that's the only option they have to do and is to engage politically. And that's our failure as the quote unquote revolutionary forces to show people a different reality. So we have to deal with the reality that some people in this country are now like, oh yeah, this is a, a new way forward. And we have to show them that, oh no, this is not the way forward. It's the same thing, just re rocked. It's just, you feel me? Yeah. It's like, what did Obama? get you realistically and now it's going to be even worse you know because shoot black women is going hard for Kamala black women is the big base of the democratic party and what happens when they throw out that black woman and put Gavin, Gavin Newsom and then that black woman you know is pro Gavin Newsom they go from that to that right so we also got to see this as a part of a strategy because this is what the democrats the ruling class is talking about is how do we get the black vote? Okay, we'll get you riled up around Kamala. She gonna fail, and then Kamala gonna say, "Okay, we need Gavin Newsom, and we gonna need Shapiro." Anyone but Trump, white man. Anyone but Trump. You feel me? Anyone but Vance at some point. Anyone but DeSantis at some point. All right. This is a product of propaganda, you know. But for us, what we have to do is create these programs. Be in the community, you know, because realistically, 
I think we also, on the left, we have to just be truthful about the state of black organization and black organizing, new African organizing, the state of quote unquote leftist and revolutionary organizing in this country. Because the reality is most of it is liberal, if not all of it. And it's like a cause playing a revolution. Because we have nothing to offer. For the most part. Nothing to offer. But protests. And yelling at the white man. What does PSL have to offer? What may, what national black organization truly has something to offer at this point? That has been built. Yeah, besides like an, uh, an opinion. You feel me? Like from a real material, like where, what, what organizations are there realistically? Like, let's just be real about that. And the organizations that are there, like how much are we actually cosplaying this revolutionary stuff versus actually having the day-to-day skills that are needed for a nation? You this is what we me? get at ourselves all the time too. Like these are the conversations that we be having in cadre for folks who feel like, you know, we might be. Uh, being hard on other organizations, we say to ourselves all the time. Like for one example, like the crime I include group. our organization yeah. in this. I'm just <laughs> people don't know that you. Yeah. You feel me? Like yeah. like we talk about the issue of like crime in Oakland, right? Yeah. Like we say all the time, how can we tell people to not want to hear, to not want to believe in more police? You feel me? When like we don't have the ability to go outside and have daily, minute by minute patrols of the community. When we don't have the ability to actually sit with the youth and get them to divest from this uh, backwards, uh, immoral, uh, cultural and value system that's that's been imposed upon them. So until we have the ability to do this, it's like Mm -hmm. the best we like, okay, like, yeah, we offer analysis. And it's just not to say that we don't do good work, but like we have to talk about like materially, like how many people is our work actually impacting and how much is it doing to uh, curtail the uh, negative impacts of neocolonial subjugation. Of imperialism. <laughs> of like, a global uh, empire. What is it? That shows how powerful it is militarily. Like, let's just be honest. You know, people talk about multipolarity. What, where is it? What is it? Sh- how is it showing up? Like, let's be real. At this state. Outside of summits and you feel me? meetings and conferences. Like, well, like Outside of it? economics. Where you is know? it showing yeah. You feel me? Like, let's be real. People talk about, oh, the empire is, you know, I'm like, the empire is doing what the empire is doing. Yeah, there might be uh, shifts economically, but realistically, from a military standpoint, look look at what it's doing. Let's just be honest. Now, look at the condition of people here in America. Let's just be honest. Look at the condition of organizations. You know, but this is where, right, the people Senate becomes important. Right. Building outside of the system, building community, building uh, structure, uh, building relationships. You feel me? Because what happens when there's another tech shutdown? (laughs) What happens when your phone is shut down and you don't have no relationships built? You don't have relationships built across the country. Networks of communication that, you know, aren't through the enemy's structure. Because that's that's what this nation is on the verge of at some point. That's what they're testing it out. Shutting down airports, shutting down technology. That ain't just random. But how are we actually creating communities that are strong? And we can only do that through actually building programs for decolonization, building actual infrastructure in our community, building economics in our community, building institutions in our community, actually being able to produce something, having technical skills, (laughs) having skills that can build a nation. And we have to ask ourselves, where are we? Because in the state of the world where we are right now, compared to other movements, like we are so far underdeveloped. We are so backwards compared to resistance movements in South America, compared to resistance movements in West Asia, compared to resistance movements uh, on the continent in Africa. We're so far underdeveloped, so far behind. We're so far behind compared to even what is happening with the far right and how developed they are, how much infrastructure they have built, how many institutions they have built, how much (laughs) militancy that they have. We are so far behind, and I think we have to be very honest about that in this political moment as people who want to tell the truth, 
as you know the quote unquote revolutionary forces, whatever yeah. that is. Well, I don't know what it is. <laughs> well, we have to be very honest about where we are. Yep. In order for us to move forward. Be serious about um you know what we can and cannot do and I think start to be truthful about the level of sedation we actually suffer from here uh, and the level of, you know, delusion and cognitive dissonance. Um, uh, I would say we are offering some solutions, right? Number one, being truthful with ourselves and uh, examining our, um, our individual and uh, organizational capacities. Uh, it's like what uh, Sophia Bakari says in a world before, you know, like being able to uh, go through like that process of uh, criticism, or like what she says, like a rapier knife, like that sharp criticism and like that fine tooth of like looking at what you actually can do. Um, so that's one element. But I think uh, another question is, I guess, for like the for the broader masses, um, what are we encouraging people to do? If we're saying like, okay, we know what Trump represents, far right, far right ultra nationalism, right? That good old fashioned Euro American settler colonial, make America great again, founding fathers, 1776 morale value, ethos culture. That's what he represents, right? Uh, and Kamala, we've had, have, have identified as a neo colonialist, right? We know that a vote for her is a vote for genocide, a vote for. Uh, domestic exploitation. So if those are the only options and we saying like, we're not going to participate in that, uh, what are we telling other folks to do? Yeah, I, I think the solution is evergreen, meaning that it is always constant, mm -hmm. <laughs> meaning it is always uh, applicable, right? Whether uh, Trump is in office, whether Obama is in office, whether <laughs> Kamala Harris, whether whoever is the next president or the future of this country, quote unquote, uh, the truth remains that we have to build programs in our community, organizations in our community, uh, cadres in our community, where we're actually building uh, autonomous infrastructure uh, that serves the new African nation, that uh, engages the new African nation in the material needs that we have to be able to transform our condition from a, a, a colonial condition uh, to a condition where we're independent, right? So, uh, why would we continue to buy into thinking that this genocidal system is going to save us? It's not. We know that for a fact. It will not save us. It will not free us. We have to realize that we are our own liberators. And through realizing that, that means we should be building our own institutions in our community. We should be building our own uh, businesses in our community. Businesses that aren't capitalist but are producing uh, capital that is needed to sustain a movement. If we're still busy sustaining ourselves uh, from, you know what I'm saying, they money, we ain't ever going to be free. So we have to be able to build the infrastructure that is needed to take care of a nation. We need the free food programs. We need the grocery programs. We need the tenant programs. We need the health clinic programs. You know what I'm saying? We need the farms. We need to build these day-to-day -day things that require, that, to, that sustain human life. And when we're able to actually do that in our communities, the community is going to see that, hey, the people is taking care of the people. And if the people is taking care of the people, I'm going to believe in the supreme will of the people over our day to day realities versus the supreme will of the corporate ruling class determining every single day uh, who gets food and who doesn't, who gets good shelter and who doesn't. Right. But that can only be through the people deciding that we want power, that we want freedom that we want independence, that we see ourselves uh, as uh, connected as human beings, that what happens over here in Acorn is the same thing that's going to end up happening to somebody uh, in New York, <laughs> right? So we see that interconnected nature uh, of our condition. And when we see ourselves in a communal way, we are going to fight for that. But we don't see ourselves as human beings. Yeah. <laughs> we don't treat each other oftentimes like human beings. Right. We're in this stuck state of colonial neurosis to where it's we become this hyper individualist type of culture. We got to push back against that. And the way we do that is through community building. It's yeah. through building organizations, revolutionary cadres. It's through the mass consciousness of new African people. It's removing that 
uh, virus <laughs> that is updated into our minds and revolutioning, revolutionizing ourselves to change our consciousness, which is going to change our day-to-day ways of being. It has to be mass consciousness, mass national consciousness of our people. Yeah. You know, and how do we do that? By being a community, by building programs in the community, by serving a community, by moving the masses. Everyone's like, the masses, this, masses, that. The masses right now are in a failed state. We got to move the masses from one position to the next position. And again, that's why I was mentioning like the people Senate. We got to build the people Senate out. Build organizations, build a method of communication, methods of governance that is outside of their governance. Building these ethos. Building these communal ways of acting. And this is going to take time and a lot of hard work. But if we fail to do this shit, yeah. we going to be in this... Whew, we're going to be slaves. <laughs> you know? So, again, that's why we have to build organization, revolutionary organizations, uh, study history, apply it, and not get stuck in. You know, I think one thing I want to say is we get stuck a lot of times in the dogma, you know, especially in America. I don't know. We just get stuck in this, like, dogmatic stuff of, okay, Chairman Mao said this or Lenin said this, but niggas ain't applying this to... 2024 yeah george jackson said this like if george jackson was talking about fascism and we could almost not define it in the 60s mm-hmm. what do we think it is now <laughs> you know what i'm saying like so how do we make sense of our reality in new ways and we're innovative we're technologically innovative you feel me we're not just getting stuck you know i think those are uh we got to get out of uh i think some of the dogmatic thinking that the left has been producing as well and really get into our day-to-day reality and get into the community uh, and build cadres. Put that work in. Like when I hear you talk, it's like okay, we gotta work. And I think uh, oftentimes that level of work can seem daunting to people uh, because of how much like conscious effort it requires. But like you're passively working for it is the daunting. state, but you do you're working for yeah. the state every day. Whether you want to, excuse me, like it might not you might not uh like it might not. I guess you might not always be aware of it, but like you're putting forth the work. You're supporting the state mm. every single day, one way you like it, whether you like it or not. Whether that's paying taxes, whether that's voting, whether that's, you know, supporting these corporations. Like we all do it. You feel me? And so the way that you can start to shift that scale is by doing some of the more uh, anti state work, you know, for lack of better words. And it is daunting, but what option do we have? And I think as people, uh, who have been people who want to be dedicated to struggle? There hasn't been a struggle that hasn't required uh, severe work that hasn't required becoming a new person. That's just like the reality of the situation. For if you look at any people's struggle, whether that's the Black Panther Party, whether that's shit, the Nation of Islam uh, under Malcolm X, whether that's uh, the PAIGC and Guinea Bissau and K Verde with Emil Carl Cabral, whether that's the PDG with Seco Toure, whether that's the Convention People's Party with Kwame Nkrumah, whether it's the FLN in Algeria, uh, Hamas, Hezbollah, whoever you want to talk about, like these people had to become something new. They had to put in work. We just can't, we can't avoid it. They put in work and put in sacrifice. We just can't avoid it, bro. And offer martyrs for the cause. We, we can't avoid you it. You know, man. like that's, you know. We ain't really, like, the conditions haven't got bad enough yet for us to decide. You know, like, that's just, reality is the science that the imperialists have, you feel me? But Rob made this point, bro, where he's like, you know, he said, uh, I think it was his grandpa or his pops was telling him one day, like, man, uh, you ain't got to learn from your own, you ain't got to, you get the smartest person learns from other people's mistakes, for lack of better words. You feel me? Like, we could just, we got eyes to see. We just being selective of what we want to see <laughs> we got eyes to see. <laughs> we got some eyes to see what's going on bro you know like uh, but we, we choose not to though yeah. you know and at some point that choice ain't gonna be there is because it's gonna be bad and i don't want it to get to where and, you, yeah. like what, what what you just said in terms of like the some of like the things that we like the like very practical skills that we don't have or abilities that we don't have i don't want it to get that bad because you know like and i also think like it's like a disservice to the people who came before us because a lot of these people have like mapped it out clear for us. Like it's like what they say in the Quran: there are signs in this for those who want to see. You feel me? Like if we just open our eyes, like a lot of these people have put forth like a lot of hard work. The information is there to make sure that we don't bump our heads. You know what I'm saying? Like they actually put it forward. They put it forward and they mapped it out plain as day. 
Like this is what yeah. this is where you could you feel me learn from. This is this is how you do this. Like they gave it to where you can kind of like like that's Jaleel the beauty of being a youngster. Yeah. You feel me? Like you get to learn from the elders. Jaleel literally gave us a blueprint. No generation has had a blueprint the way that we've had. The way that we have information wasn't stored the way that it you feel had. me. Like Malcolm didn't have no blueprint, right? But the words of Malcolm and the martyrdom of Malcolm inspired the Black Panther Party. You feel me? Mm-hmm. But that's what we also dealing with, like you said. George didn't have a blueprint. Yeah. But that time period produced a blueprint that Jalil gave us. I haven't seen a blueprint that's been better. That we got to actualize and, and shift to the conditions that we're in right now. That's the, the blueprint is there. But how many people want to accept... A, leadership of theory and ideas that have been produced. You know what I'm saying? Or actually accept what has to happen in this country for change to occur. It's a multi-pronged thing because you name, you say it all the time, right? This is unprecedented times. So while we do have uh, all this very important uh, information and like this history scaled out for us, you know, the level of like infiltration and suppression as it pertains to like our... Uh, cognitive abilities is in a level that it hasn't reached before too right we talk about like okay uh, the way that fascism right the ability to gain control over all sectors of the of the society and like dominate economy and get people to buy into their own oppression the way that that has developed since you know George and, and Krumah were putting forth the ideas in the 60s and 70s like nigga they got a black uh, fucking whatever sorority she is running for president right now. Like, <laughs> like you feel me? You got niggas, you got Meg Thee Stallion. Like, <laughs> niggas couldn't imagine this that you feel me? Like, one of the world's biggest rappers being at, like, you know, it's just like, hey, that's, that's you say it's just different times, bro. It's different it's, times, and we a lot more bought into Zionist the American control system. control of Hollywood and mass media. You know, you talking about a time where niggas couldn't even get movies. Yeah. You feel me now? It's like, man, you got how many black directors and motherfuckers winning Emmys and Grammys? Like, integration is advancing. If you're talking about participation in barbarism and capitalism and exploitation, it's, like, it's the there are more niggas who are able to do it now. Cultural weapon of genocide. You know? But, and, then, and then we sitting here trying to deprogram. You know, we finna get our 300 views. <laughs> But they ain't gonna be able to say we didn't try. Hey, I'll you know. Hey, it's again, it's just the uh-huh. consciousness uh-huh. that leads to positive action. You know what I'm saying? Uh-huh. Like Imam Khomeini, that's what he was doing. He was recording lectures and spreading that out on mm-hmm. cassettes, and that started a Islamic revolution in Iran. So hey, Inshallah. you know what I'm saying? Uh-huh. The mass consciousness of our people. You know what I'm saying? We gotta uh, d- d- disseminate information. Spread the truth of what's happening and uh, build a movement, build infrastructure, and build cadres and call a spade a spade and stop lying. That's why we need y'all support, man. We support. need y'all to spread this, spread it out. Tell the people, man. We know Text. we're going to get, I said 300 views, that's a lot. We're going to get thousands of listens, right? <laughs> but, like, so, man, it ain't 2016. We man. know we're we going to get thousands of listens. But, like, share this, man. I challenge you, my call to action is if you're listening to this podcast right now, copy and paste that link and send it to 10 people. Send it to 10 people. Don't even become a patron. If you want to become a patron, that's on you. Do that. But (laughs) call to action from this episode. Send this podcast to 10 people. Send this to 10 people who you think might even vote for Kamala Harris, too. Mm. Let's engage those people. Free to land.